Am I the only woman? Or is, is there only a handful of us women on the planet who love our sons and our stepsons and our partners and our, even our ex-husbands? I love my father and grandfather and uncles and my male cousins and my nephews and my male friends every bit as much as I love my mother, my grandmother, my aunts and female cousins and nieces and female friends. Why would I not step up and say something when I see the men in my life and the boys in my life being discriminated against? the way men have done increasingly over the decades uh, when they see women in their lives suffering hardship, prejudice, or injustice. My anti-feminism evolved hand in glove with my men's rights advocacy. There was really no other way things could go. The more I investigated feminism, uh, the further back I went, uh, the more I realized that not only was it a cause of some of the problems that men and boys face today, uh, things like poor male educational attainment or lack of due process in sexual assault and domestic violence accusations. But it stood squarely in the way of finding any solutions uh, to even those problems that it didn't cause. Things like male genital mutilation, military conscription, and the workplace death gap. More than this, feminism has planted itself squarely in between men and women at every level of interaction, from strangers on the street to husbands and wives, sowing seeds of female resentment and erasing the sacrifices and good deeds of men. Hi everybody, I'm Girl Writes What? And uh, uh, an online friend of mine was uh, really freaking pissed off after reading a recent effort on the part of, I can only assume, is a traditionalist woman in uh, trying to figure out what the heck is wrong with men these days. I'm, I'm going to leave the article in the information section along with uh, some other stuff. But uh, basically... Just like many traditionalists and feminists before her, she, she really missed the mark by a freaking mile. Um, even though she really, she kind of danced a little closer, like within a hundred miles or so of the, the few core issues that currently discourage men from being the good little married drones they're supposed to be. Despite being critical of feminist attitudes that she rightly sees as anti-male, the article was still absurdly gynocentric. It was very much about what women want and uh, why they're not getting it. And, uh, like, that is getting married, having babies on women's schedules as decided by women. Um, I almost have to wonder whether this author even bothered to ask any actual unmarried males why they're refusing or not bothering to uh, man up before writing her article. But, as I said, it at least poked at the surface of the festering boil that is the systemic nature of the problem, even if it didn't give it the lancing it truly deserved. Her conclusion seemed to come down to why buy the cow when you can get the milk for free, uh, and why get a good job when women are independent and can just give milk away for nothing. Um, both are backhanded criticisms of women's behavior, which is kind of nice, somebody brave enough to blame women for their own troubles, but, but they really fall far short of any real examination of the underlying issues. So, I'm going to give it the old college try and uh, give a bit of an overview of what I believe has become a multifaceted problem. Now, I'm going to read a recent, uh, part of a recent article from Hartiste, uh, who said a very great deal with some serious literary flair uh, it's kind of pearls of wisdom from the pit of social nihilism that is the pickup artist community. And, uh, and he actually was spot on about some things, yet, again, overly simplistic about others. I'm just going to quote some of the relevant, relevant bits and leave a link to the article below. He says, If you want to know why men are running away from marriage, children, and beta provisioning, one major reason is that the women available to these working-class men are flat-out disgusting. What man of normal mental health and active libido wants to romantically woo and date, let alone marry, a beastly, waddling, tatted mountain of pustulence, 
with the issue of three other men barking and nipping at her cankles. And let's not forget that economically empowered and government-assisted women, slaves to their hypergamous instincts for a higher status mate than themselves, cannot help but winnow the pool of men deemed acceptable marriage material. When women say, there are no good men left, what the astute observer hears is, there are no good men left thanks to a combination of my increased expectations and decreased attractiveness. He goes on to say, to the factory farm tower, ivory tower sociologists studying marriage trends and turning out paper after paper of half-assed hogwash, there's a whole other world out there. It's the world of men, and in that world, men's desires matter. You should think about incorporating that ugly reality into your theories. As blistering as that little snippet was, it raises some very important points, and I think the most important one is that men's desires matter. When men can't find women they desire who are willing to partner with them, then why would they partner? And, uh, and it really can't be stressed enough. Uh, that the reality of divorce and family law in our culture plays a huge part in men's growing contempt for marriage as an institution. It's not that men are commitment phobes. It's that women seem increasingly commitment incompatible. The word commitment has, in fact, in female parlance, come to mean up until the moment I'm no longer 100% satisfied with the person I married. And that attitude's only going to lead to more and more divorces as more and more successful women effectively set their sights higher than they reasonably should while their youth and attractiveness wanes, leading to a growing number of them feeling like they settled even if they didn't, even if they scored someone two points above them on the overall attractiveness scale. One symptom of this, I think, uh, that's very telling is OkCupid's recent revelation that women on their site deemed 80% of men less than average attractiveness. That is, 80% of men were below average. This does not compute. This in no way is in line with reality. This is about women's expectations. And oddly enough, no one, least of all women, seem to really give a shit what men want in a partner. Why can't men just be happy with what's available? Well, when you look at what's available to the average man in his 30s or early 40s, a 35-year-old woman who hollers yes over the jangling of her biological clock while unable to keep the grimace from her face because he's a bigger loser than the five guys she dumped in her 20s and now she's having to settle. Or a divorcee who's already financially annihilated and emotionally crippled at least one other man. Or... Uh, a single mother who's collecting reams of child support from one poor schmuck while her other baby daddy manages to duck his obligations because he's a drug dealer and his income's off the books. And yeah, I'm exaggerating, but you see my point. And no, not all women are like that. Lord knows, I know not all women are like that. But frankly, the consensus among today's women seems to be that this state of affairs is just the new normal. Uh, even responsible women will often frame such destructive choices on the part of other women as somehow valid and defensible. The sentiment in the mainstream is that men should just man up and go along with pairing up 2.0, who cares what men want, and that essentially a woman's behavior and life choices should have no effect on whether she's able to attract a good, reliable man. All of that really doesn't speak well of the principles of even those women who are more well-situated. In fact, I think it's safe to say that the fewer female voices of reason there are out there, the more men are likely to wash their hands of the entire idea of partnering. But I honestly think it goes even deeper than just the baggage the average unattached woman now carries or the danger of ending up an emotionally and financially devastated statistic with generous every other weekend access to one's children that's keeping men from manning up. I kind of started thinking a little bit more about this when I uh, watched Typhon Blue's uh, extremely thought-provoking video uh, on what she calls the apexual male, a man who, uh, who does not identify with other men. Uh, but merely identifies with his place in the status hierarchy. I, I highly recommend anybody to go watching 
go watch that and, and I'm going to leave the link in the information section as well. Her video got me thinking about the White Feather Girls. For those of you who don't know, this was a group of young women in the UK during World War I who went around bestowing white feathers of cowardice on any man they saw in civilian clothes to shame them into enlisting. Now, when I consider how vulnerable so many men were to those kinds of shaming tactics, vulnerable enough to enlist in a war that killed 10 million uh, to preserve their manhood in the eyes of bitchy women they'd never even met, I just can't believe that it's only the risks of marriage, as onerous as they are, that have rendered men impervious to the kinds of shaming tactics employed by traditionalists and feminists who seem increasingly desperate to strong-arm men back into their old roles. So I think beyond any discussion of the risks of marriage, unfairness in family court, all of that, I think way down at the, at the core of things, uh, maybe it's about uh, a positive male identity. Now, male identity almost always re revolves around doing rather than being. Uh, most of that doing has revolved around being of use in a uniquely male context. Most of men's usefulness through history has derived from learning male skills and performing them well, embodying a male role in the service of women and society. In the more turbulent past, those roles uh, needed to perform a valuable service to women or the community that women couldn't or shouldn't be expected to perform for themselves. Now, this is the most common path, in my opinion, to a positive male identity because men lack a mechanism for automatic own group preference. Simply put, they just don't relate to other men automatically just because they're men. Women have this bias, which provides them a natural ability to form cooperatives and relate to other women and seek consensus through their strong mechanism for own group preference based on gender alone. Um, given the gender roles through most of human history, this mechanism really makes sense. Uh, their individual value as, to put it bluntly, breeders meant that in a survivalist environment, you didn't throw a woman on the trash pile without a pr pressing reason. Adjustments were made when they could be to keep as many women as possible within the sisterhood. This is where you'll find a ton of attention in female spaces given to things like tone and being nice and you know, emoticons with smiling faces and getting along, even when there are disagreements. Uh, a lot of their interactions are about comfort level and feelings of acceptance. Men on the other hand, lack the hardwiring to form a preference for maleness based merely on maleness. And that really just makes sense when you think about men's roles for the last couple million years or so. Um, roles that involve things like beating the men down the valley to a pulp when they threatened his women and children, or competing against other males within his community for a shot at the mating game. Given those roles, automatically siding with one's own gender over the other is just not going to work. And it's not that men can't manifest any forms of own group preference. It's just that when own group preference manifests in males, it, it just isn't based on maleness alone. There has to be a common purpose, a common set of ideals or principles, a common duty or cause, a common doing, or a common position in the status hierarchy. So men can indeed identify with each other and relate to each other and be team players among other men. Uh, you see it in churches, military units, fraternities, sports teams, even sports fans, political parties, movements, project teams, stuff like that. And while they'll often form hierarchies within those contexts, those realms can be sources of a sense of loyalty and brotherhood among men. The myth among feminists that men will insult each other for displaying feminine traits because they see women as inferior is really just that, a myth. Uh, men do this because women have a trump card that they don't, a trump card that bestows intrinsic value on them, their uteruses, and they retain that value even when they gender bend a little. A woman who acts like a woman isn't seen as inferior at all. A man who acts like a woman uh, has always been seen not as a woman, but as a woman without a womb. That is, a woman with no value. 
He has no female value, and he has no unique male value, therefore he has no value at all. And unlike women who, uh, who were valuable in and of themselves, men who were not useful did, and still do, get thrown onto the trash heap of society. In the currency of reproduction, an ovum might go for a thousand bucks, a uterus, a cool mill, an ejaculation, that's worth about ten cents. To be acceptable mating material and worth a community keeping him around, a man had to do more than generate sperm. And when the only thing keeping you from becoming completely disposable as an individual lies in differentiating yourself from the feminine to spare women those onerous tasks, well, guys are going to enforce that shit. It's my belief that this is why men have always tended to define themselves by their roles. Father, husband, working man, soldier, career man, family man, middle class man, politician, activist, all of that. In other words, roles to exist in which allow them to relate to other men who also occupy those roles and to derive a positive and meaningful identity from performing their masculinity through those roles. And I also think this may be why suicide rates for men skyrocket after divorce. You haven't just taken away his kids, his wife, his assets, and, and a good chunk of his income. You've effectively stripped him of a huge part of the male identity he's built around himself. So, I'm thinking that for most men, forming a positive male identity in relation to other males requires a couple of things. Uh, a male role that's differentiated from the female one, or at the very least a male-oriented environment, and, well, positivity. Men used to be able to construct a positive male identity out of marriage, that is, through the respected and uniquely male role of husband and father. When that identity is increasingly characterized by society as superfluous, obsolete, or in the words of Harriet Harman, unnecessary to social cohesion, it's no longer a way for a man to defer his disposability, is it? Moreover, when that identity can be unilaterally stripped from him on the whim of, of his wife, even when he did everything right, marriage ceases to be a positive way for men to define themselves as men. It really becomes a way for men to define themselves as chumps and idiots, and nobody really wants to define themselves that way. Moreover, from sitcoms to rom-coms to TV commercials to billboard ads, the role of husband and father is increasingly one of playing the incompetent buffoon to sassy, smart, together, disrespectful wife or even child. In the mass media, there's nothing noble or respectable about husbandhood or fatherhood anymore. And when the roles within the marriage uh, have become virtually indistinguishable and interchangeable, a man's role becomes less and less male. It's just a role. Um, it can be a path to meaning and fulfillment if he's lucky, and it, it may be something he desires to do and to become, but it's not necessarily a path to defining himself as a man. So we can scratch that one off the list, even for men who've been living under a rock when it comes to divorce law. Marriage and children no longer offer a reliable path to a positive male identity. It's no longer positive, nor is it significantly male. The workplace is yet another milieu that has largely lost its maleness. And that's not to say that women ruined everything. It's not so much the presence of women, but rather the alterations in environment and interaction many women demand when they want to engage the world through the paid workforce. A male space that leads to a positive male identity doesn't need to be free of women, but it needs to be male. Uh, it needs to be an environment that suits their psychology, not one in which they end up being metaphorically castrated if they want to steer clear of trouble with human resources. And I'm not even talking about vulgarity or expressions of sexuality. I'm talking about things like aggression, ambition, ribbing, competition, passion, authority, plain speech. All of these are often discouraged when women are present in order to spare feelings and prevent discomfort. Outspokenness is replaced with drawing room rules of discourse and ingenuity with protocol, all of which render a feminized workplace, though tolerable to men, no longer a path to a positive male identity. It's no longer a male space, and it no longer appeals to the psychology of men. 
The workplace has therefore become a ladder. Fewer men feel driven to climb in order to construct their identities. Combine this with the fact that uh, their job is frequently on the line the moment they step out of the rigid, rigid uh, restrictions on their masculinity um, and offend an, an overly litigious female coworker. A large number of men are not only becoming disenchanted with the expectation to perform in an environment that doesn't feed their nature and has set them up to fail, uh, and that sees him as disposable, in the absence of those uniquely male-centered psychological rewards and motivators, a growing number of them are finally opening their eyes and waking up to the negative aspects of wage slavery. And that is a pill that once taken can't be unswallowed. In every single space, males congregate where women have elbowed their way in and demanded changes. You seem to find large numbers of men just kind of giving ground and eventually losing their drive to really perform there. And, and again, I don't think it's the presence of women that does this. It's the enforced necessity to change one's behavior in order to maintain a proper decorum around them and the changes in how those places function that women often demand. It's the expectation that the environment and the men in it should adjust to suit women's needs, rather than expecting women to adjust themselves to that environment. A few bastions of maleness remain, places where women are often welcome right up until they begin to demand the environment change to suit them, at which point you'll begin hearing a lot of male protest. I can even see this tolerance on the part of men when, say, a woman sneaks into the men's room because the lineup's too long at the ladies' room everything's fine unless she suddenly takes offense at men behaving the way men do in a restroom by farting and pissing in her presence. So where are men retreating to? They're retreating to the internet and the few men's spaces that haven't tailored their rules of conduct to suit women's easily offended natures and need for comfort. They're retreating to the MRM where a common set of ideals and values bonds the community and allows them to define their maleness irrespective of society's or women's approval. A place where words and ideas are more important than the tone or the smiles that may or may not lie behind them. They're retreating to the hierarchy and uniquely male objectives of the pickup artist community where competition and scorekeeping are indeed still allowed, even encouraged, and where there are men for others to admire or to mentor, where they thumb their noses at women, what women say they want. Society was not working for those guys, so they invented their own society, and they're running with it by their own rules. Y you see it in comics and video games and those related forums, online venues where refusals to police speech are usually deemed misogyny, and the men there just don't really give much of a fuck. You see this in men going their own way, who've taken a stand based on a realistic assessment of what's in it for them, and who maintain their self-respect not by complying with society's expectations, but by disregarding them. And you see it in the beer buddies, hookup, and Xbox culture. Part-time jobs men tolerate but don't care about. And you really see it in the gynocentrism of manginas and white knights who supplicate and pander to the feminine even when it's ugly or amoral, differentiating themselves from the feminine through their blind worship of it. And why? Because all of the approved paths to a positive male identity, the paths society both endorses and depends on, are gone. Even when men don't consciously realize it, they, they know it somewhere in the backs of their brains. Men have always been willing to work and sacrifice and sweat and bleed if they were rewarded with a means through which to see themselves as worthy of respect. But when every single role society wants to cram you into is no longer a way to respect yourself or have the respect of others, then it's really time to throw those roles away. And one thing that Typhon Blue's apexuals at the top of society, like Bill Bennett and uh, Obama, feminists like Kay Heimowitz and Katie Royfe, the traditionalists like Suzanne Venker, one thing they're never going to realize is that using shame 
to try to coerce men to do what is expected of them isn't going to work this time. Because while it's possible to shame a man into giving his life for his country if there's a promise of respect in it, it's impossible to shame someone into working his ass off and risking his whole future just for the joy of looking in the mirror and seeing Homer Simpson or Ray Barone or Dilbert looking back at him. When the cost of society's approval is the self-respect you derive from a positive identity, it ceases to be worth it to a lot of men. Anyhow, those are my ideas. Um, these are just things that I've been thinking about, and, uh, and I don't absolutely do not think that they are written in stone. If anybody has any um, anything to add or any criticisms of my assessment here, um, I will happily entertain them in the comments. And uh, I guess I will see you all again later. Not too long ago, uh, I had it out with a feminist who had come into a male safe space uh, from a feminist blog uh, just to scoff at the idea of male disposability. Um, she, she went there and basically said that the entire concept was a myth, that men's lived experiences were completely wrong, and that they were just a bunch of whiners who were complaining over nothing. Uh, yeah. Anyhow, that got me thinking about the concept of male disposability and how that interacts with the feminist movement. Male disposability has been around since the dawn of time. <laughs> uh, and it's based on, on one uh, very, very straightforward dynamic. Uh, when it comes to the well-being of others, they come first, men come last. This is, this is just the way it, it has always been. Uh, seats in lifeboats, uh, <laughs> being rescued from burning buildings, uh, who gets to eat? Um, really, society places men dead last every time, and society expects men to place themselves dead last every time. Humans have always had a dynamic of women and children first, and that has not changed at all. Uh, the 93% workplace death gap it has to be evidence of this, uh, if only because there's n nobody with any kind of importance or power who's interested in changing it at all. In fact, I remember reading an article in a BC paper not long ago uh, that described the increasing proportion of female injuries on the job as a huge problem. And the insane thing was, the change reflected a decrease in male injuries rather than an increase in female ones men's injuries on the job had gone down because the economic downturn had put so many men out of work in the resource sector that there just weren't as many trees or pieces of heavy equipment falling on men as there had been before. And yet, this was framed as a huge problem for women that required immediate action to solve. Um, it, it's just crazy. Uh, it's like if men aren't dying at work at 20 times the rate women are, we must be doing something wrong as a society. Back when we were still living in caves, that attitude was necessary for human survival. Nature's a really harsh mistress, especially when you think of all the animals that never ever get to die of old age. Uh, things were a lot different for humans through most of our history on this planet than they are now. Life was dangerous, human settlements were small, isolated from each other, and one big disaster that took out a lot of women pretty much meant the end of the entire shebang for that group of people. So really, the level of importance that a human settlement placed on the well-being of women and children uh, reflected almost always how successful that settlement was. And that can be expanded to encompass entire societies. I keep hearing from the feminist camp that femaleness has always really been undervalued by society and that maleness is preferred. Uh, but I've always contended that it's the exact opposite. The feminine is intrinsically and individually valuable, uh, simply because females are the limiting factor in reproduction of any species. 
uh, when it comes to producing babies, every woman counts. Whereas, biologically, one very happy man could probably do the work of hundreds in that regard. So the level of instinctive importance we humans place on the safety and provision of women and their children, it's one of the main reasons why we've been able to be so successful that we've come to really dominate this planet. And while I will concede that this drive to keep women safe from all harm has often resulted in extreme limits being placed on women's mo mobility, uh, their agency, their power of decision to direct their own lives, uh, all through history in many cultures, and in many cultures even today, uh, I think it's telling that those cultures tend to be the most backward. When you consider the restrictions placed on women in places like Afghanistan, and then you consider that if we bombed them into the Stone Age, it would be progress, I think you can conclude that the most successful societies had a really, really good balance between allowing women freedom and the ability to choose and direct their own paths in life and the need to protect them and provide for them. However, uh, feminists will insist that this, uh, these kinds of restrictions being placed on women in those kinds of societies are the ultimate form of, of objectification. Uh, you lock up your possessions to make sure that they will never be lost or stolen or harmed. Uh, honestly, if I were a guy on a battlefield, I might appreciate being objectified in that way. I think if I was going to be an object, I'd rather be a sexual one or somebody's prized possession than an object that can simply be thrown in the trash or smashed into pieces in the service of somebody else's purpose. Feminists also have a very simplistic idea that our willingness to absolve women of their crimes, uh, slap them on the wrist, uh, spare them punishment, um, it comes from a deep disrespect society has for women's personhood. Uh, not seeing them as full human beings, capable of looking after themselves, that we see them as children who don't know any better. And yeah, well, there are parallels uh, there in our desire to protect both women and children from uh, not only their own poor decisions, but the full consequences of their shitty behavior. It's really not as simple as they try to make it out to be. I mean, seriously, even today, even today in 2011, uh, we fully expect that if it comes down to a, a man and a woman in a burning building and you can only save one, the expectation is that you choose the woman every single time. So honestly, whose humanity are we placing above who's here? We're not talking about going to work. We're not talking about getting an education. We're not talking about having the freedom to decide what you want to be in life. And we're not talking about getting to take Taekwondo. We're talking seats and lifeboats here. Uh, the person in the lifeboat is going to survive no matter how capable or incapable they are of managing their own life. And the person going down with the ship is going to die no matter how independent, self-sufficient, and awesome he is. That's the equation. One life more valuable than another. And the woman wins every time. So honestly, is there any argument anywhere that women's humanity has always been held in higher regard by society than men's. To be important to society, a woman merely has to be. A man has to do in order for his life to have any meaning to anyone other than himself. I think it was man-woman myth who said our society reduces men from human beings to human doings. And I really think that's an apt analogy. Uh, we measure a man's worthiness to wear the title of man <laughs> and therefore the title of human, through how useful he is, uh, either to society or to women. And one of the most useful things a man can do, even now in the eyes of society, is to put women and children before himself. And while I think there's plenty of argument that this attitude is at least partly innate, the way most survival traits are, even collective ones, uh, if it starts in the chromosomes, we really do everything that we can as a society to reinforce this dynamic. Studies have shown that even though baby boys tend to cry and fuss more than baby girls, uh, parents are quicker to attend to or console a baby girl than they are a baby boy. Um, even just the level of acceptance of infant male circumcision in our culture 
when female genital mutilation was banned pretty much the first afternoon we all heard it existed. It really says a lot about the differing expectations we have for males and females. I mean, speaking as a mother, uh, the last thing I would have ever wanted uh, was to hear my child cry, especially when they're at an age when they're completely helpless, completely at the mercy of outside forces, and utterly dependent on the adults in their lives for every last thing. And yet, even knowing how painful that cut is, we expect baby boys, only days old, for fuck's sake, to just suck that up. And just think about what even these very first interactions and experiences, these differences in how we nurture our babies, depending on what gender they are, what this teaches them. Uh, what do we teach baby girls when we attend to their crying so quickly? Uh, we teach them to ask for help because their needs are important. Uh, we teach them to let us know when they're afraid or in pain because it's important for us to know when they're sick or in danger or hurt uh, so we can do something about it. We teach them that when they're sad or lonely uh, to summon comfort and comfort will be there. We teach them that they're important. Uh, their needs and well-being, both emotional and physical, are important just because. And what are we teaching baby boys when we leave them to cry? We teach them there's not much point in seeking help, because it will be grudgingly given, if at all. Uh, we teach them that they should become self-contained in their ability to deal with uh, emotions like fear, uh, helplessness, loneliness, sadness, pain, distress. We teach them stoicism. We teach them to suck it up. Uh, we teach them that their fear and their pain are things that are best ignored. We teach them that their emotional and physical well-being are just not as important as other things. I mean, given all of that, is it any wonder it's like pulling teeth to get a man to go to the doctor when he's sick? What we're teaching that baby boy is all the things a man needs to know and feel and believe about himself if he's going to stand in front of a cabin with a rifle while his wife and kids hide inside. We're preparing him for the day he has to fix a bayonet to a rifle and charge a hill under enemy fire. And we're preparing him to make a decision to resign himself to an icy fate while women and children escape in the lifeboats. We are really teaching him to internalize his own disposability. And baby girls, by attending to her crying so quickly, by letting her know she's inherently important to us, we're preparing her for the day she has to think of her own safety first, even if it means the man she loves is left standing alone with a rifle in front of a cabin. We're preparing her to take that seat in the lifeboat. We're training her to not allow guilt or empathy or acknowledgement of a man's humanity or any sense that he might just maybe deserve it more to convince her to give her seat to him, because for millennia, the human species absolutely depended on her feeling 100% entitled to that seat. And that brings me to feminism. You know, the patriarchy smashers, those righteous avengers of equality, uh, dogged dismantlers of every single gender role. What exactly is feminism doing to dismantle this traditional role of the disposable male? Feminism's greatest victories have only reinforced in everyone that society still owes women provision, protection, help, and support just because they're women. In its collective dismissal and abandonment of male victims of domestic violence, it only reinforces in men that it's pointless for them to ask for help because men's needs are of no relevance and their fear and pain don't mean anything to anyone. Feminism teaches us to put women's needs at the forefront of every single issue uh, political or social, whether that issue is domestic violence law, sexual assault law, institutional sexism, social safety net, education funding, homeless shelters, government funding for shovel-ready jobs that didn't stay shovel-ready once feminists got wind of them. Everywhere you look, everywhere you look, there are feminists pushing their way to the front of the line, demanding women's fair share of all of the goodies, the good stuff, the, the loot, the booty, the cookies. Even if women don't need it, even if women don't deserve it, and even if somebody else needs it and deserves it more. And they get it, because we give it to them. Feminism has done nothing but exploit this dynamic of the expectation on men to put everybody else before themselves, especially women 
women's safety and support, women's well-being, and women's emotional needs always come first. This is the most stunning piece of society-wide manipulative psychology I think I have ever come across. Feminism has been on the down low with old school chivalry right from the start, and they might seem like strange bedfellows for sure, but they're not, because both concepts are built on a firm foundation of female self-interest. We made our way as humans through a really harsh history, and we became the dominant force on this planet, and one of the reasons we were so successful is because we have consistently put women's basic needs first, their need for safety, support, and provision. It was in humanity's best interest for women to be essentially self-interested and for men to be essentially self-sacrificing. But we don't need that dynamic anymore. I mean, our species is in no danger of, ex of extinction. I mean, we're seven billion people clogging up the works here. What's the worst that could happen if we all just collectively decided that men were no more disposable than women and women were no more valuable than men? In fact, the greatest danger I see to us right now is that in our desperation to bend over and give women everything they want and everything that they say they need, we've unbalanced society to the point where we're just in danger of seriously toppling over. And really, the only difference I see between the traditional role and the new one for men with respect to disposability is that maleness, manhood, it used to be celebrated, it used to be admired, and it used to be rewarded because it was really fucking necessary and because the personal cost of it to individual men was so incredibly high. But now? Now we still expect men to put women first and we still expect society to put women first and we still expect men to not complain about coming in dead last every damn time. But men don't even get our admiration anymore. All they get in return is to hear about what assholes they are. Is it any wonder they're starting to get pissed off? Anyhow, that's not all I have to say about this subject. Uh, but it is all I have to say about it today, since my kid is about to walk in the door um, home from school. So I am going to sign off, and hopefully I will see you all again. Um, for now, I'm Girl Writes What? Ciao. Okay, so this one is uh, for the ladies, really. Um, and uh, it is really women who are going to have to do uh, a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of uh, consigning feminism to that dustbin. Um, and I think we all probably agree why that needs to happen, um, but uh, maybe not everybody knows why women have to take a major role in that. Um, back in 1849, uh, during a temperance dinner, Susan B. Anthony uh, stated the obvious, and she said it was the obvious uh, to everyone. It was common knowledge. Women are the arbiters of social and moral norms in our society. By her reasoning, if women collectively made it known and clear that they would not associate publicly with men who had been drinking, most men would stop drinking. While her reasoning was a little simplistic, it didn't account for uh, the addictive nature of alcohol and other drugs, she and other female activists and women's organizations managed to do one better than convincing men to stop drinking. By 1910, these activists had convinced most state governments within the Union to be willing to amend the Constitution of the United States and prohibit alcohol altogether. The tactics of female temperance activists ran a gamut from Carrie Nation barging into saloons, yelling at all the men there and smashing the place up with a hatchet, uh, to putting on plays, going town to town and putting on plays, uh, showing the ill effects of alcohol on women. Drunk men in these plays engaged in domestic violence and spent the family paycheck on alcohol, leaving their wives and their children destitute, starving, hungry in the streets, dressed in rags. 
A constitutional amendment is no mean feat in the U.S., and politics is usually downstream from culture. Uh, all of the groundwork, the cultural groundwork, to convince the population and politicians uh, that banning alcohol was a good idea, all of that was done long before women's suffrage, in about 50 years, in over the 50 years prior to women getting the vote. So that women were able to persuade an entire nation to consider such a thing in an era before the female vote existed, that's a testament to women's social and moral power and their effectiveness as props in um, morality plays. Of course, prohibition turned out to be one of the most disastrous uh, nationwide social experiments in U.S. history. Um, contributing to the de development of organized crime in the U.S. and resulting in thousands of deaths and convictions, placing police and gangsters into a state of urban warfare in which innocent people often ended up as collateral damage. But all of this, all of this disaster was informed by society's desire to protect and provide for women, its knee-jerk willingness to view men as dangerous and irresponsible, and its eagerness to listen to the complaints and demands of the fairer sex. During the suffragette era, many women active in community and charitable works rejected women's suffrage and fought hard to keep votes out of women's hands. For them, women's position elevated them above partisan politics. It facilitated uh, their, their exemption from the vote, facilitated their moral and social authority to secure the support of male politicians and community leaders for their works. How could they claim the moral high ground as women if their fingers were dirtied by insertion into the combat combative, contentious, degenerate pie of uh, partisan politics? In fact, in the US, it was only when suffragettes changed their tactics and convinced women that they needed to have the vote because no one else would be capable of bringing ethics and morality into the cheap, dirty realm of politics, if not women, that more women were convinced to support female suffrage and it finally passed. In 1902, a woman named Mary Harris Jones was broadly described as the most dangerous woman in America. What vile crime did she commit to earn this title? She organized striking minors in, uh, during an era when men who sought to unionize were routinely beaten and killed by privately hired police forces. She organized a children's march from Philadelphia to the home of President Theodore Roosevelt in protest, protest of lax labor laws. Her secret weapon, she recruited wives of minors and mothers of child laborers. Uh, to take up broomsticks, bang pots and pans, and shout, join the union. She felt women had a role to play in supporting men as a motivating force for men enduring hardship and danger from the establishment and as cultivators of public concern. A man denied a fair wage was a family denied a fair wage. A man denied safe working conditions was a family at risk of losing their primary means of support. Those were the tactics she employed. And while she used primarily young girls employed in silk mills as the public face of her crusade over child labor standards, the education and education rather than labor for children in the US, her advocacy eventually helped bring about sweeping reforms within industry in its treatment of all workers. Unlike the Trade Union League active in the US at the time, Mother Jones fought for all workers and she enlisted the help of women not just to serve themselves, but for the benefit of the men they loved and depended on. Known among supporters as the Miner's Angel, she was denounced on the floor of the US Senate as the grandmother of all agitators. In 1889 and 1890, a group of women in West Virginia uh, and Virginia and Kentucky, calling themselves the Daughters of Mother Jones, played a crucial role in presenting the case of exploited minors to the public and the press. Despite being imprisoned more than once on a variety of charges, from sedition to conspiracy to commit murder, uh, with sentences, initial sentences of up to 20 years, she generally only spent a few months in prison on any of these, uh, she spent relatively little time in custody, and particularly, uh, this is in interesting given the severity of the offenses she was uh, convicted of. DLC, where I'm going here. 
At a time when male union organizers were being shot to death by private police forces and kneecapped by union busters, this one bulldog of a woman managed to get issues that directly affected men, women, and children, and families on the public agenda. She got politicians and corporatists, corporatists like John D. Rockefeller Jr., to listen and implement reforms, uh, long-sought reforms. And what was her message? Women's suffrage? Pfft. That's what she said to that. Uh, you, don't need he uh, you don't need the vote to raise hell, she said. Her message was one where women have an obligation to the men in their lives, as noble and necessary as men's obligation to them. That men and women are on the same team, not in competition, and fighting the good fight together for the benefit of both and for the benefit of their children and their communities is the way it had to be done. She saw the roles of men and women in her, in her fight as not in conflict, but as complementary. And I guarantee you she had a solid understanding of women's power to create change and women's obligation to use that power not only for their own benefit. I get asked a lot uh, over the last nine years or so, why, why do you do what you do? Um, even more so these days, since I've been speaking to uh, more virgin bums on virgin seats than ever before, uh, AM talk radio shows and, and uh, podcasts that don't deal with these issues. And there's really no single answer uh, to why I do what I do. I'm sure there are people out there who, when asked uh, why Karen Strawn does what she does, uh, they'll say uh, she, has a son she has sons and other men in her life and she cares about them. And while it's certainly true, um, that's not the whole, the whole story uh, by a long shot. I'm not just a mama bear protecting her cubs. I could do that by advising my sons to go their own way, which I have. Um, give them the male equivalent of that conversation every parent has with their daughter um, regarding men who might want to take advantage of them. Um, you give a different talk to your son, but the point is the same, how to avoid getting hurt by the opposite sex. Um, and I could do, uh, and I do what I can to instill proper values in them, including those values that acknowledge their inherent value. If that were the only reason I wouldn't be here in London, why would I be? My sons will be fine. They won't be falling into any traps or pits specially designed to destroy men because they'll know them when they see them and uh, they'll see them for what they are. And while I don't see myself as a modern day Mother Jones, uh, nor would I describe myself as her figurative daughter, I find myself in agreement with her approach to social and human rights issues. Uh, you can't help women by hurting men, and you can't help men by hurting women. We're stuck with each other. Uh, we are fellow travelers on this journey through life, and if I'm going on a long road trip, I'd sure rather be stuck in the car with someone who sees me as a fellow traveler rather than an adversary or potential exploiter. Perhaps most troubling is that men have stepped up and supported women's causes for a long time now. Not just since the 1960s and 70s when male feminists like Warren Farrell took up the causes of equal pay and equal respect for women. In the UK, women's suffrage had support from the majority of MPs, all of them male, by 1910, for crying out loud. No one even asks men why. Why would you walk a mile in her shoes? Why would you pin a white ribbon on your lapel? Why would you take a pledge uh, in, uh, take pledges and run in a, in a fun run to raise money and awareness for breast cancer? Why would you do that? Why? Nobody would ask a man those questions. Why would anyone ask a man why he would support an initiative to end partner violence against women, or why he would support an initiative to find a cure for breast cancer. We all know the answer. It's because men view these causes as worthy of their support and advocacy. Because men all have mothers, grandmothers, sisters, wives, daughters, and friends, female friends that they love. Girls and women in their lives they want to see safe and content and free. And yet when I go on some talk radio show for a 12-minute spot, almost invariably the first thing I am asked is, why do I do this? Why do you do this? How did I find myself advocating for men's rights and men's issues? This is just so strange. Why would a woman do it? And I almost always say something other than, 
why wouldn't I? Um, <laughs> even though that's really the proper answer. And to my mind, that's the saddest thing of all, that all of these men, mostly male radio show hosts, uh, who probably would put on four-inch heels and hobble their way around a public square or jogging track to walk a mile in her shoes to end domestic violence, um, society understands why they do that, and they understand why they would do that, and yet society doesn't understand why I've laced up a pair of metaphorical steel-toed work boots and marched my clomping mile for the men and boys in my life. They need to ask. They just don't get it. And what these radio hosts are really telling me when they feel the need to ask is, uh, you're a woman. You're not really obligated. Uh, and that's what makes you special. I'm, I'm special? Am I the only woman? Or is, is there only a handful of us women on the planet who love our sons and our stepsons and our partners and our, even our ex-husbands? I love my father and grandfather and uncles and my male cousins and my nephews and my male friends every bit as much as I love my mother, my grandmother, my aunts and female cousins and nieces and female friends. Why would I not step up and say something when I see the men in my life and the boys in my life being discriminated against? The way men have done increasingly over the decades uh, when they see women in their lives suffering hardship, prejudice or injustice. My anti-feminism evolved hand in glove with my men's rights advocacy. There was really no other way things could go. The more I investigated feminism, uh, the further back I went, uh, the more I realized that not only was it a cause of some of the problems that men and boys face today, uh, things like poor male educational attainment or lack of due process in sexual assault and domestic violence accusations, but it stood squarely in the way of finding any solutions uh, to even those problems that it didn't cause. Things like male genital mutilation, military conscription, and the workplace death gap. More than this, feminism has planted itself squarely in between men and women at every level of interaction, from strangers on the street to husbands and wives, sowing seeds of female resentment and erasing the sacrifices and good deeds of men. Under its hegemony, we are mandated to acknowledge, as Sarah Hansen Young has been doing ad nauseum in Australian Parliament the last little while, all the ways male violence harms women and children and all the ways masculinity is to blame. But we are never allowed to point out the acts of heroism and sacrifice, such as those we witnessed just recently in Thailand, and acknowledge that there's something intrinsically masculine at work there too. Traditional masculine virtues have been desexed. To evoke those virtues and call them what they are, masculine, that is to insult, belittle, and demean women who, we are told, are every bit as capable of those traits and those deeds. Only in the ways men cause harm uh, do we still uh, label these things male, even when they're not significantly male in prevalence or in nature that so many women have tolerated this state of affairs for so long is one of the saddest things I can imagine. That so many have embraced the prejudices and bigotry of feminism, that it is taught as a discipline in universities and strickling down into primary and secondary education, that's a testament to our complacency and our credulity, um, and not just of women, both men and women. And women are going to have to step up and really roll up our sleeves and help clean up this mess. And it's not because it's all our fault. It isn't. Not when the last president of the United States proudly posed for a photo in a this is what a feminist looks like t-shirt. Not when feminist organizations like the National Organization of Men Against Sexism exist. Not when people like the Three Michaels Mesner, Kimmel, and Flood continue to preach a feminist analysis of masculinity in universities and in the media. This is not all women's fault, but con consigning feminism to the dustbin of history, that's a job for the ladies. Like Susan B. Anthony asserted in 1849 at that temperance dinner, women are in a unique position as the arbiters of moral and social norms. 
As the success of women's activists in the temperist and labor movements demonstrates, we are uniquely situated to harness the compassion of society to accomplish change in cu cultural attitudes and in institutions. And despite what certain female politicians would have you believe, <coughs> just Phillips, <clears throat> Even when we're not exempt from the harshest forms of pushback, we are almost invariably treated with more gentleness by trolls and angry listeners than men are when they put forth even the same arguments. And because feminism is an avatar of women claiming to represent our interests, men are uniquely helpless to fight against it. I would argue that they can't effectively destroy this toxic ideology because it is so easy to portray them as bullies and troglodytes, violent and malevolent and opposing feminism only out of a desire to harm women. Frankly, and frankly, finally, I think it's our responsibility. Society is ours too. We non-feminist women may not be responsible for making this mess, but we did sit back for a long time and just let it all roll along. And uh, I have children. I want all three of them, my daughter no less than my sons, to inherit a society capable of recognizing everyone's humanity and where men and women are no longer warring nations but are able to become the fellow travelers and team players they've always been meant to be. As Warren Farrell said once, twice, probably a hundred times, when one gender wins, both genders lose. Men and women need each other. And we all saw a week ago, glued to our TV screens, watching as hundreds of men pulled together and put their lives on the line to pull 12 boys and their coach out of a flooded cave in Thailand. We also saw those men engaged in the work of heroism, not just the glory and the risk, the work of it. And because that work was necessary, that's why they did it well and also because it was best suited to them. But the work of reducing feminism to a fringe position, viewed with, I hope, one day, the same abhorrence by ordinary people as racism is right now, well, we non-feminist and anti-feminist women are going to have to roll up our sleeves and get to work, because who else is going to do it? Thank you. And nobody's allowed to ask, why do you do this? Because um, I am so, so sick of that. Karen. Yes. Do, do you see any progress being made? I do, I do. The very fact that I'm getting in, you know, maybe two talk radio show interviews a day over the last three months, um, thanks to a, uh, a wonderful lawyer in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, who runs a group called the Men's Health Network, uh, he asked if he could hire a publicist for me, and the publicist is getting me all kinds of uh, interviews and stuff on, on radio and podcasts. And I don't know that that would have happened, um, you know, five years ago. Uh, I do think that part of the impetus for uh, particularly conservative talk radio in the U.S. for wanting to talk about stuff like this is that... Um, the Me Too thing has uh, has really made an impact, and it's got men really uh, nervous. And I think that essentially uh, that push is uh, is something that they f they feel now needs a to to be pushed back against. And so that's helped me get my foot in the door. Most of the things that I talk about are. Uh, feminist uh, campaigners getting rid of, uh, you know, they got rid of the grid girls here. They want to get rid of NFL cheerleaders in the States. Um, they want to get rid of, um, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, sexualized uh, women, uh, you know, in, in media and all of that stuff. So essentially, uh, men are feeling encroached on, finally, uh, down there, encroached on enough to actually want to do something about it. And and then I get my foot in the door and I introduce 
the more nuanced ideas and the other reasons why we need to actually look at feminism, see it for what it is, and, and try to undermine it or get rid of it. So, Do you get good feedback from people sometimes? All the time. All the time. I, you know, like, I, there are people who ask me, you know, you must, or they say, you know, you must get a lot of hate, a lot of hate mail, a lot of hate emails. I never have. I never have gotten a whole lot of that. Probably 99% of the feedback that I get, uh, whether it's in comments under my videos or whether it's in the emails and, and things like that, is, uh, is positive. So, yeah. Um, choose, choose. Good day, Karen. Um, entertaining as always. Um, sorry, uh, I, I know I know how much you hate flattery. I do. Um, uh, this this question might be a little sprawling because it's occurring to me on on the basis of what you've said. I think there's two sides to the coin. Yes, I think women have an obligation to maybe undermine it, but I think probably everyone in this room has faced what I find the most frustrating part of being an MRA, which is uh, the apathy of other men. Um, I, I, it just it, it drives me nuts that these these issues that directly affect men that I interact with, they just don't take seriously or couldn't care about. Um, the one thing that you touched on was unionism, um, and I'm just it, it's just a kernel in my head that sort of occurred to me while you've been talking. Is there a place for male unionism? Because in terms of socio-economic movements that have actually achieved something. I think the union movements in most Western societies have actually got something done. Is that potentially a perspective we could move towards? Um, I think, honestly, that there, there's a, a role that women are going to need to play there, too. Um, you know, one of the things... I use Mother Jones because she's such an iconic figure um, and because she very obviously used women uh, in ways that were able to get the sympathy of, of the public, um, but and girls, too. But uh, there, you know, like somebody once sent me a, a, a transcript of a whole, a bunch of transcripts of uh, he hearings um, from colliery accidents um, in, the, in the UK, in Britain, in the, you know, from about 1850 to 1885, something like that. And even there, uh, there was just this sense of apathy when, when, you know, you'd have a jury that's being asked whether the, the mine is, is at fault, that the company is at fault for, you know, these 43 miners dying. Um, and uh, often in order to get sympathy from the juries, they would parade the widows and, and these orphan children in front of these juries and they would get them to testify and they would get them to weep and cry and all of these things and that was what was effective. Um, otherwise, uh, I remember in one, uh, the guy who was actually sort of prosecuting or he was arguing that uh, that the colliery was actually at fault for the accident, um, he said that uh, the jury was signing off on, you know, no fault. Um, before testimony was even complete. There were still witnesses to testify, and uh, a witness was still testifying on the stand. And, uh, and they're all signing, yeah, no, it's not, there's no fault here. And uh, so, honestly, you know, the power of women is... is I'm, I'm, I'm going to... I hate quoting Anita Sarkeesian. <laughs> but she really did... Um, she really did hit on something when she said, in the game of patriarchy, women aren't the opposite team, they're the ball. And so, and, you know, the ball is really important. Um, and men, uh, when you, 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 women are used to call men to action all the time, right? And often they're uh, cynically used to call men to action. So I think that really the only way that you're that we're going to uh, be able to approach this is not as a male union, um, but as uh, essentially repairing the relationship between men and women, and and repairing families, and you know repairing society, um, and it has to be seen as benefiting everybody. So. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure that when, when uh, you know, like, the unions are about workers' rights, but in 
in order to actually make unionizing acceptable, the rhetoric around it had to be about families. It, it really absolutely did. Um, you know, when a man dies in a, in a colliery accident, his wife is left with no means of support, you know. Um, and, uh, and if the company, often the companies were not compensating these women and, and, you know, they got very, very unpopular in their tactics, um, because of that, uh, you know, first this guy dies and now you're not even going to pay his widow. Like what, what the hell's wrong with you? So essentially, you know, I, I do think that we need to take a more, perhaps a more cynical approach and use women in some of the ways that, that feminists use them. Um, and, uh, because that that's what is a call to action for men and that's also uh, a way of essentially ensuring people that uh, getting rid of feminism or you know uh, fighting for the, the rights of men and boys isn't actually going to hurt women because people are not going to do it if that's what they think is going to happen at least not on mass so who I, I'm not picking because I don't I don't like picking so um, I, I, f I always feel bad for the people that I don't pick so okay um, hi Karen um, can you think of any suggestions to help persuade more women to join the cause anything uh, reasoned arguments or emotional arguments or anything any other similar ways well I think once it gets a little bit fashionable and I mean like that's that's happening too we've got uh, the Liberty Bells we've got ladies for Philip Philip Davies we have uh, women against feminism. We have uh, all kinds of all kinds of women from you know with all kinds of sort of um, perspectives. Uh, traditionalist women, uh, more progressive women, uh, women who want genuine equality. Uh, all kinds of women are sort of lining up, you know, according to their ideals and their goals, and forming groups and becoming popular. And you know, the the internet has a great deal to do with that. Um, being able to find each other and w there is this weird thing about women is they they don't want to be involved in something generally uh, to be involved in something that is considered unpopular or nerdy you know no feminist was interested in video games what when it was like you know a bunch of bullied nerds in their basement you know uh, playing these goofy games um, and being nerds together it was only when it became a multi-billion dollar industry that's bigger than Hollywood um, that uh, that you saw feminists wanting a piece of that pie and wanting to control content there. So, you know, slowly but surely, uh, women are going to start making this more and more popular and uh, and more women will join. That just seems to be the way women are in, in general, so... Yeah, thank, thanks, Karen. Um, I, I, I'm just curious, um, having uh, spoken to non-feminist uh, women and ordinary women, they, because they've benefited so much from the uh, huge advantages in the legal system in their favor, um, it's very difficult to convince them to give up the winner, the winner-takes-all system, to give up all the benefits of, of being the primary carer. To, to give up the benefits of hypergamy, for example. I mean, how on earth can you convince an ordinary woman, though it's fine, you know, look after the man, let him stay at home and look after the children, you go out to work. Um, and, you know, how on earth can we overcome this uh, huge female advantage in the system to encourage women to join us and say, no, no, we're, we're happy to give up 75% um, of the divorce settlement. You know, it's fine, no problem. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a tough one. Um... You know, I think I think that a lot of these women uh, they wake up a little bit when it happens to their sons, um, or their brother, uh, or maybe their dad. Um, so as long as there's that kind of carnage going on, there are going to be women who've been affected by that um, through the men that they care about. And um, but yeah, no, I, I've often described non you know ordinary women um, as viewing uh, feminists the way uh, looters view a race riot. They're not there to riot about race or anything. They're not there to protest or, or whatever, but they'll smash and grab and, you know, and uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's great. It's an, it's an advantage, right? You know, you just go in there and, and take stuff. Um, so essentially, you know, that, that is a tough one. And I think other women are going to have to do it. Um, 
too because you know like men arguing for these things they particularly the alimony stuff I think that enough women, you know, when you look at Florida and and places like that and you see that 80, 80% of the public supports shared custody after divorce, that's not that 80% isn't only men. Um so you know, there there are women out there who will support it and uh, and there are women out there who are doing advocacy work for that. Diana Thompson um, you know, uh, in the U.S., she uh, runs an organization called Women Against Paternity Fraud, um, and she does all kinds of lobbying, at, you know, in Washington, D.C., about uh, men's issues, including shared custody and stuff like that. Um, often, shared custody bills are introduced to legislatures by women. Um, in Maryland, I believe, it, it was a female delegate who introduced the bill. So, um, you know, we are out there. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, convincing, I think, convincing other women that, you know, it's not really that scary to share custody of your kids with their dad. I mean, I, I, I never understood that mentality. I was just like, take them, take them, I'll pay you, right? I need a break. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Hi, Karen. Um, um, I like to think of myself as an eternal optimistic. Okay. So I'm going to put this out. Um, thanks to people like you and a lot of people in this room, I think in a, probably less than 10 years, men's rights will be taken as seriously as women's rights. What do you think about that? Well, I think it's it's already starting, right? You know, like it, it used to be, you know, 10 years ago, um, I would I would argue with feminists and uh, they would deny all, outright the existence of uh, male domestic violence victims. They would deny outright uh, all kinds of things that um, you know uh, that women can that women can and uh, do sexually assault men and that the prevalence is is not that different uh, in terms of numbers. Um, you know, between men sexually assaulting women and women sexually assaulting men. Um, they used to just flat out deny it, and now they're starting to have to admit to it. Um, they are starting to have to acknowledge that the numbers are not so different, um, that even if they want to believe that, um, that uh, female victims of partner violence vastly outnumber male ones, they're having a harder and harder time justifying the female monopoly on services. So essentially, that that's coming about. Things are changing, and the the less that they can just flat out deny, and the more they actually have to come into the conversation and defend their position, or adjust their position, which is has been happening slowly but surely. I wouldn't I wouldn't say ten years though. Um, you know, ten years is like highly optimistic. I think uh, it might not even happen in my lifetime, particularly if I keep smoking as much as I do. So. <laughs> Um. It works. Oh, yeah. sorry. Um, you were talking about using women like the feminism does. So yeah. would it be like using the victimhood like they do? Um, no, no, I don't think so. I think you know, like there is an a, a, an aspect of uh, women being victimized by some of these things. You know, just talk to any second wife whose kids are wearing you know beat up sneakers because he, her husband is paying through the nose for you know his ex's kids' ballet lessons and and private school. So I mean, like there are women who are genuinely uh, hurt by some of this stuff. Um, and girls as well. Um, and one of the most interesting things uh, that I've come across in, uh, and the really horrible thing about this is like they stopped doing research. I can't find any research after the 1990s on this. Um, men who rape women, uh, they report uh, a, a, signif a significant portion of them, uh, just, uh, just above a majority, report being sexually abused uh, in childhood by a, an adult woman. Um, and the majority of them come from single mother uh, families. So when you're looking at those kinds of things, uh, the things that we're doing uh, wrong in terms of uh, 
ignoring female perpetration of sexual abuse and and uh, subsidizing single mother families and things like that. Um, that's actually having an impact maybe 20, 30, 40 years down the road on other women. Um, so essentially, like, we do need to actually point out how feminism harms women too um, and how some of the things that we've done in terms of social experimentation, because I wouldn't say feminism is to blame for the welfare state in the United States and how that got started. Um, they certainly had a hand in it, but they weren't the only ones nobody wants to see women and children starving and homeless um, but at the time nobody was willing to uh, in the 1960s when all this started nobody was willing to pay an able-bodied man to sit at home and do nothing so the only way a woman could get a check for herself and her kids was to boot the man out or for him to leave on his own uh, willingly so you know you when you look at the whole picture women aren't they, they aren't doing very well either. They're less happy than they were in the 1970s, less content with their lives. They're stressed out. Um, consumption rates have gone way up. The more divorces you have, the more uh, single parent dwellings you have, the more resources you use. Um, 30 billion gallons of water in the U.S. could be saved if everybody stayed married a year. 30 billion gallons of water a year. So, you know, just because you're only having to have water in one household. So, yeah. We do need to use women, possibly even cynically. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, in the Nordic countries, when you address issues of equality uh, and uh, issues uh, of feminism, the reaction from feminism is, is often, oh, are you afraid that equality will go too far if you criticize or address something within the feminism? It might be the same in other parts of the world too. Uh, I think that's a strange thing to say when, when uh, if I address an issue that are you afraid that uh, equality will go too far. Uh, m my question, I don't know if it can be answered, it has maybe been addressed already, but what can we as men do in order not to always come one step behind feminism ideas and action uh, when we try to address it and balance it and, and correct it? What, what can we do instead to, to be proactive, to, to get uh, progress done without being perceived as criticizer, uh, criticizers of women and their issues and advancement. Well, it's very difficult for you to do it. That's why it's probably a job better suited to uh, to women to actually do the convincing. Um, I do think that you know, and I'm not I'm not uh, crapping on all the progress that's actually been made mostly by men over the last you know 30 years or so in terms of these issues. Um, you know, men do uh, have a role to play in advocate in advocating for themselves. Absolutely, 100%. Um, it's just you have such a narrower path that you're allowed to walk in order to do this. I mean, I say, I sometimes say the most crazy ass shit. Um, you know, like I have said uh, in in public that, you know, I, I would give up my vote, right? Like, I, I would do that. Um, if, if I thought that it was necessary to bring about proper uh, rebalancing of power in society... I'd happily do that. I know most women wouldn't, but I would. Um, I have said uh, on uh, to a uh, national news broadcaster's uh, journalist uh, one time that uh, that the way women achieve suffrage uh, and the way they have achieved many of the gains early on, like the Tender Years Doctrine and and the Married Women's Property Acts, uh, and how those uh, really did not take into account. Uh, both sides of of the set of obligations and responsibilities under coverture um, that uh, that that was actually uh, I, I think that that was a, a shitty way to go about it I think that that needs should have been done differently and I have no um, admiration for the majority of feminists and suffragettes of that era um, I do think Sylvia Pankhurst was pretty cool um, but only because she abandoned that whole thing and then just went and did charitable work and, and stuff. But um, but essentially what you have is, is a situation where men, it's like Jordan Peterson said, uh, there's no way for men to control a crazy woman. 
um, because you you have this barrier which you cannot cross as a man and a crazy woman can be coming at you with you know violently and uh, and you're still going to be perceived as the aggressor if you do something physical to stop her so and that's sort of the whole dynamic um, men are gonna they, they just have a tougher tougher time with with getting all of this stuff out there but you should all keep doing it because Hi, Karen. I'm, I'm Steven Svoboda. Um, mm -hmm. It's good to be here. And um, so believe it or not, I'm getting married a week from tomorrow in California. I'm sure no one else here can say that. <laughs> and um, there, oh, thanks. There, there's a reason why I mentioned that, though, because my, my fiance and I talk a lot about these issues, as you can imagine. And she's never really considered herself a men's rights person. She never really thought about it till she met me, which was at uh, Showing of the Red Pill, by the way, the film that Cassie J made. And Cass, Cassie's here. Um, so we met through that. She felt like I had to come to this conference a week before our wedding. And we, as I'm sitting here th listening to you talk, I'm thinking, the problem is that people like my fiance, we have to position ourselves in a position where there's really no rhetorical spot for us. We have to think independently and find a way to, to believe what we believe without any sort of name that we know of and t unless we come here for what we're doing. Whereas feminists, I think, have set things up where the default way to go is to be a feminist. And even if you're not really a feminist, you call yourself a feminist anyway like Christina Hoff Summers. That's such a problem. How do we fight against that, Karen? I mean, you've thought these things through so well. How do we fight the reigning paradigm? It's Well, you, you just have to chip away at it constantly. Um, you know, like it, the idea of, com a friend of mine once uh, said that the idea of compassion for men is like Teflon. Um, you, can, you, can, you can talk to somebody about it and they'll nod and they'll get it and then whoop, gone. Um, it just slips right off like a fried egg. Um, so it's it's just it's very very difficult. It's it, like the problem that we face is that we don't have all kinds of old norms, uh, particularly uh, ones that we uh, are not just cultural but are also part of our instinctive uh, you know framework. Uh, we don't have any of those to exploit. Um, Ninety percent of what feminism has done has it has either done through exploiting men's desire to protect and provide for women, um, which is I I believe an inborn uh, desire. It's it's evolved, um, either exploiting that or um, convincing men that because that they don't love women enough, that they actually hate women, um, that that. It's, you know, you have to have this massive outpouring of love for women. Uh, and the moment you put your foot down or say, no, tell, tell a woman no, uh, that means that you hate women. Um, I, I've never been able to figure out, other than them exploiting these, these sort of old ways of thinking, um, in, in inborn ways of thinking. Um, so we don't have any of those tools. Um, compassion for men has never been a thing. I mean, like it's been in terms of, like, Think about the quintessential scene where the highwayman, pull, you know, is going to rob this guy, pulls over a, a coach and he's going to rob this guy and he puts the gun or the blunderbuss or whatever to his head. And what does the guy say? He says, please don't shoot. I have a wife and family. Right. Think of my family because I know you won't think of me. Um, so really that's that's what we're working with um and and it's extremely hard work and frankly i think it needs to be a discipline in universities just to figure out what the fuck has gone so how it's gotten so crazy and people can't see that you know we have we have this society festooned with initiatives to end violence against women end gender based violence against women uh you know help women support women uh look after their health all of these things seven federal departments in the US dedicated to women's health and well-being um you know and none for men and yet somehow when feminists say our society is misogynistic nobody laughs them out of the building like how how does that work um, so it's we're fighting against our instincts here. Um, my presentation last year in Australia was all about all of the really sticky problems, the 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 instinctive problems, the social psychology at play, all of those things, because those are the things that are going to be really difficult um, to 
we're going to have to find bypasses and workarounds because I don't think there's any shaking it loose. So I don't know if uh, one one more question. I know, I know. It's not very hopeful listening to me. I'm probably Thank ki you. killing all the optimism it's in the room. It's Guten Grund from Norway. Oh. Hi. So we come all the way to hear you uh, and the rest of the speakers. Um, Thank you first for your brilliant uh, speech and uh, inspiring speech. But you left some very big questions in my head, and that was, you said, it's the women themselves who must take the fight against uh, feminism mm -hmm. and the wrongdoings of feminism. It needs to be a cat fight. Yeah, yeah. which means we can't do anything. The men no, can't no, do you, anything. No, no, you have to you have to actually keep doing what you're doing and keep the pressure on. I mean, like, that's absolutely necessary too, but in terms of... If, you, if there were no women taking up this cause, mm. you guys would be so easily written off mm. as, as just a bunch of woman haters, a bunch of troglodytes, probably violent, definitely malevolent, and nobody should listen to you because you're dangerous mm. um, if there were no women involved in this at all. Mm. So, and so women really need to make sure, women in this movement need to make sure that we're visible, um, that, that we're, we're like a human shield for you guys. Um, in, in some ways, um, because they have to deal with us, right? And, uh, and dealing with us is not like dealing with you. They can just call you a misogynist and write you off and stop listening. But they actually have to contend with women who talk about these issues because we, we're not doing it out of self-interest and because we do have a certain authority um, to, to give people permission to think certain things. Um, that, that's one of the things, particularly men, in fact, uh, women tend to give men moral authority to believe what they believe and say what they want to say in, in many cases. Men often, if it's a little controversial, p particularly if it, if it involves women, they, they just aren't going to say it. So, so, uh, the solution, I'm just testing you on hmm. the solution. Because if, if men can't do it, they can help along, you know. Oh, but you well, said no, it's, I'm, it, it's a women who has to do take the fight mainly. Uh, women and then you can say perhaps women and men should start associations together and work together. Yes, you yes. Know. Call, and then they can't call themselves a feminist movement or a masculine movement. But in Norway now, there is a, there is a page or a Facebook site called Equalist, you know, right. which is gathering both men and women, you know, mm -hmm. but that's only a network, you know, not, a, not an association. Is anything of this happening in America or Canada where men and women go together, you know, on equal terms and drop the word feminism and drop masculinism and go find a sort of common ground right. on some ideology there? Well, in Canada, we have a group called the Canadian Association for Equality. And they are not a men's rights organization. They are not an anti-feminist organization. But they are very, uh, they do a lot of good work, um, including inviting me to speak over and over again. Um, but uh, they, they essentially, um, they have a focus right now, a stated focus on the issues of men and boys, because they believe those issues are being underserved at the current time by organizations and advocacy groups and by the system. Um, I think that honestly, if it came right down to it and they gained enough ground that they, you know, didn't have to have that focus, they would certainly open their, their focus a little bit wider onto other issues that didn't involve men and boys or that were not predominantly involving men and boys. So, um, so there is that. Uh, and they also, um, they work with feminist organizations. Uh, they've invited feminist speakers uh, and feminist panelists, and they actually network with feminist organizations to get services um, for men who maybe are victims of partner violence. Uh, so essentially what you have is is this sort of hybrid organization like you're talking about where um, maybe the focus right now is on men and boys, but it's definitely got lots of women involved and, and they're, they're doing good work and, and they're trying to be very equalist about things, so... I don't know about the states, though. Is there is there any more time for a question? Anybody else have? Okay, yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, my name is Mike. Uh, I, this question is about the socialization of, of boys and girls when mm -hmm. they're quite young. 
I was reflecting on the fact that I had devalued my own feelings and that the the, the women who've beaten me up, if you like, have also devalued my feelings. And, and was reflecting on the fact that um, observations show that even by the age of seven, boys don't even know the words for their feelings um, and girls are much more sensitive to their feelings. And then I was sort of reflecting on the the socialization that I received in terms of the colors I'm allowed to wear and mm -hmm. the textures and uh, you know, all that. I wonder whether you'd done any work at all, because it seems to me that the healing needs to start, uh, you know, almost at the age of two, and, and that, that most of this caring is done by women, mm -hmm. um, and therefore, if you like, the way men are when they're grown up is it partly as a result of the socialization they received when they were small? I do, I do believe that socialization definitely plays a role. I think that you're never gonna, you're never gonna get rid of uh, sort of the um, majority of boys gravitating towards trucks and the majority of girls gravitating towards dolls and things like that, and you know, flowers and things that are pretty and playing house and playing tea party uh, rather than you know playing war. Um, and cops and robbers, I think that you're still going to have a, a fair degree of difference between boys and girls in, in those terms. Um, I, I think, you know, honestly, for boys right now, uh, when you were young, probably, it was very, very different. Um, when you were young, you were probably taught boys don't cry, um, you know, you got to suck it up and don't show your feelings and, and all of those things. But nowadays, boys are kind of being pushed in, in the other direction, and masculine tendencies, masculine forms of play are all but banned in schoolyards in, in the U.S. and Canada. Um, so you're, you're essentially saying, you know, they're not, some places that don't even let you play tag because it encourages aggression, and, you know, you're chasing someone, and that, that's not cool, and, and it people can get hurt feelings and and feel left out and you know when you get you get tagged and you're it and you know people feel singled out and it hurts their feelings and um so i think we're we're taking it too far in the other direction now and we're not allowing boys to be as masculine as they maybe want to be um but definitely um socialization does play a role in all of this um and single mothers sorry single mothers seem to be uh, you know, predominantly responsible for raising uh, boys into men who are hypermasculine. The the very men feminists don't want uh, in our society are seem to be the ones raised by single mothers, um, and uh, more involved in gangs, crime, drug abuse. Uh, you know, all kinds of nasty stuff. Um, and uh, I think it was Quinn Norton. Um, she's sort of. Uh, hacker culture's answer to Anita Sarkeesian. Um, she once said, you know, the problem is that men are raised to hate women, to hate us. And I'm thinking, who the fuck is raising these men? <laughs> right? And maybe, maybe you should have been a better mother if you managed to, you know, your boy, your son, didn't learn love and respect for women at your breast, at your knee, you know, being soothed when he's crying, um, while you watch over him in his crib, he's not he's not learning any of that. Well, maybe he needs a better teacher than you, because like honestly, um, it makes no sense whatsoever. So, um, I think are we done? Okay, that's it. That's it for me on that note. Um,